So welcome everyone to um, what was officially called uh, on the events website, co-creating the future amplifying student voices to inform course, course design or simply student voices in course design. Um, my name is John Chang. I'm a learning, I use pronouns he, him. I'm a education little consultant and a learning designer at the CTLT. And I'm here with my colleague, Nicole. Hi, yeah, also an educational consultant and learning designer at CTLT. Oh, we have more, more, more participants. I think people yeah. are just rushing in from lunch, which is great. So maybe we can move to the next slide, Nicole. I'm just gonna do an acknowledgement. Uh, we would just like to acknowledge that we live, work, play on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil tooth Nations. Uh, please feel free to share the lands on which you are joining us today in the chat. Um, so our session today will explore how we can actively seek and embed the student voice in our learning and course design so that we can provide inclusive and engaging teaching and learning experiences that lead to better learning outcomes. Um, first, we'll dive into what we already know from uh, the data from the academic experience survey and explore what we currently collect in terms of student feedback at UBC. Um, then we'll look at uh, the practice of having students as partners uh, through the Students as Partners initiative in, and how they've informed course design and, and model that type of practice called, um, and the model of that type of practice called the ladder participation. Um, and we'll also share examples from faculty, students and courses that have been practicing in this kind of partnership work. And then along the way, we'll have a couple of different large group activities that will be opportunities for you to reflect on your own practice as a, as a faculty member, as a staff, or as a student, uh, if you're interested in course design. So let's go to the next slide. So what are our goals for today's session? So what, what we intend is we intend to outline what we already know from students here at UBC um, in terms of how we're, what their feedback is in general uh, around course designs from the Academic Experience Service Survey. We will reflect on how we collect student feedback, um, look at various methods that are in place. We'll explore this model called the ladder participation, which can help us think about how students can actively engage in course designs and curriculum design. Then we'll explore, um, uh, we'll be able to explore course designs that have incorporated the student voice and then discuss ways in, of incorporating more student voices into your course design process. So essentially the goal for this session is to inspire you to move up this ladder of participation, which we'll discuss shortly. And to kick us off, Nicole, we'll look at student feedback from UBC. Yeah, so we're gonna start off today with, um, when it comes to looking at student voice, we're looking at things that we already know. And so um, we decided to look at the 2023 Academic Experience Survey. Um, so the AMS surveyed over 3,400 uh, students at UBC Vancouver uh, on various topics. Um, and if you haven't already looked through that report, I urge you to do so. It's quite interesting. Um, and there's some teaching and learning responses that we thought that we would share with you for reflection and come up with maybe some strategies uh, to address them. Uh, the first one here is uh, the classroom was the most common site of discrimination on campus. And so when we thought about some strategies that, you know, could help mitigate or hopefully erase that experience for people, um, we thought we would point to the inclusive teaching website um, in terms of a, a really great common, uh, sorry, resource that's available um, right now. That's definitely worth checking out. Um, so this website has a lot of foundational content 
um, that you can have when it comes to um, inclusive teaching practices um, in your work. Um, it also has a great um, section for professional development events and um, as they're scheduled. So you can see a running uh, list of what's available. And there's always a lot available uh, within CTLT and at UBC. Um, and in particular, uh, some of the resources that I, I tend to look at a lot on here are around you know, how to create a respectful environment in your classroom and navigating difficult conversations and microaggressions. So um, just thought that would be uh, the first little tidbit from the results that we found. Okay, uh, the next little tidbit is about assessment. Um, and so looking at this stat here, more than half of the students indicated that they would prefer it if courses provided more flexibility in terms of assessment. So with weighing of assessments, a uh, variety of methods and flexibility of due dates being the most pertinent types. So how to sort of strategize around knowing that. Um, so one strategy is to consider uh, would be to allow students to have a range of options for assessment, uh, especially when it comes to weighting. So um, for example, students could select how different assignments, quizzes, projects, or exams count towards their final grade within a given range. Um, this does require uh, some degree of initial planning and communication with your students to give them the best options that will still support their learning uh, and fulfill the course learning outcomes. Um, you may have also heard of uh, alternative or authentic assessment. This includes anything that falls out of the traditional sort of test, test, test exam format that, um, you know, is in traditional higher learning. Um, it includes things like project-based assignments, case-based assignments, uh, creative assignments such as podcasts and video presentations, experiential learning, or field assignments. Um, an authentic assessment can also be applied. Uh, that tends to mean that the skills that the students are acquiring directly translates to real world scenarios. And they're also meaningful to their lives outside of the classroom. They also involve um, offering multiple perspectives or viewpoints, reflecting the complexity of real world problems and situations. And then lastly, here we have um, a flexible deadline policy. So flexible deadlines can be a highly effective way for uh, to allow for students' diverse needs and circumstances, and it enhances their ability to manage their workload and reduce their stress. Implementing a flexible deadline policy proactively can foster a more inclusive and equitable learning environment promote student autonomy, and improve overall academic performance by allowing students to submit higher quality work that reflects their best effort. And the next tidbit that we have for you is um, around timely feedback. 56% um, of the respondents believe that they receive grades for their coursework in a timely manner prior to final examinations. So about half believe that they receive their grades um, in a timely manner. So what can we do? Well, just to stress the importance of regular feedback, um, I have a quote from Thomas Angelo here that I really like. Regular feedback helps learners e e efficiently direct their attention and energies helps them avoid major errors and dead ends, and helps them from learning things they will later have to unlearn at great cost. It can also serve as a motivating form of interaction between teacher and learner and among learners. When students can internalize the voice of the coach, 
they can begin to give themselves corrective feedback. So what can we do to help students receive their coursework um, in a more timely manner? Well, we can set clear grading timelines. Um, so clearly commuting, communicating grading timelines for each assignment and assessment at the start of the course um, in the syllabus. Um, and also consistent and um, reasonable deadlines, again, with looking at uh, ways to be flexible, um, you know, because life happens. <laughs> You can also use um, some tools in Canvas to help streamline the grading process, um, such as SpeedGrader and the rubrics tools. SpeedGrader is great for um, marking assignments right in Canvas. It has annotation tools and options for providing different, you know, text or audio or even video feedback. And the rubrics tool can also help streamline with grading um, and ensure consistency among grading. Um, yeah, and also can help students understand how they're being assessed as well by providing that ahead of time so they know how to approach their, their work. Um, and peer feedback is, is, is another, uh, peer review is also another option. Um, if, if your if this makes sense in your course, you know, set up a system where peers review each other's, uh, work and has an opportunity to provide feedback. Um, yeah, so those are just that little section there about the sort of tidbits from the survey, um, that we wanted to share with you. And if you have any questions about, you know, how to implement some of these things or questions about anything that I said, um, you know, you can reach out to me or John or, uh, you know, another learning designer to kind of work through that in your particular context. But, so that is sort of what we know from the students already. And of course, there's the option to get your own feedback directly from students. So what we know so far as um, the end of course surveys, of course, or the student experience of instruction surveys, um, that is one source of gauging student feedback on any given offering of a course. Um, so the SEIs help um, you know, sorry, I'm having a technical issue my computer. Um, yeah, so the SEIs, um, actually there's going to be a session tomorrow, I believe, um, for the Celebrate Learning. And I just, maybe John, if you can at some point plug in the link for <laughs> tomorrow's session, um, if anyone wants a hand with, um, getting to know that interface and breaking down the um, the instructor dashboard. I, I'm not sure exactly they're going to be going into that, but they did last year. The video um, is available. So if you wanted to watch that, it's a really good practical breakdown of what that looks like. And of course, it does have um, an open-ended question at the end. So, um, but, but um yeah, that can help you with some of the qualitative data that comes in through there. And of course, mid-course feedback. Um, mid-course feedback can uh, provide information about components of the learning process that the students maybe they're not understanding and therefore it can be a very important course development tool. So the website here, uh, midterm.teachaval.ubc.ca, uh, it's a great website that provides guidance on um, the process of midterm, uh, collecting midterm feedback, and some really great practical tips on there um, to use midterm feedback uh, directly and with accountability, incorporate student voice into uh, your course. 
Um, of course, there's other informal opportunities that you could uh, use to get your own feedback. Things like a one minute paper or ticket out the door uh, where you pose questions to the class that can provide some formative assessment, like, um, you know, asking students, how would you rate your current understanding of this concept? And, um, or it can be used as an open line of communication between you and the students. You can ask for some anonymous feedback on um, what they, you could be doing differently as an instructor as well. So yeah, and of course, um, help the students help you. The SEI website actually has this really good page on, um, for students actually on giving feedback that is, you know, helpful and productive and effective for the university and your instructors to use. So um, I find that, you know, making students aware of that um, page is, is quite helpful as well. So that brings us to a little break and a little discussion um, so far about what we've, what you've seen in the presentation. Um, we're wondering if any of the survey results surprised you. And another possible discussion topic or question, um, how are you currently using student feedback in your course? What methods are you using? So I think we'll skip into the next section where we're talking a little bit here about the active, the ladder of active student participation. So in Bavu and Bully's uh, model of active student participa participation in curriculum design, um, they introduced this adaptation of um, Sherry Arnstein's ladder of citizen participation, which some of you may be familiar with. Uh, this ladder of participation illustrates the various rungs or levels of active engagement students experience in a course. So we're starting from minimal engagement to full involvement at the top, and it progresses through stages that are sort of in these categories here. So, you know, progressing through these stages of, you know, passive participation to more reactive participation to more proactive participation, and then ultimately interactive participation. Um, but this model isn't without some criticism and it's not always ideal to put the students in complete control uh, or substantial control of the learning environment. Um, but so moving up the ladders and, you know, in every context is not appropriate, but um, there is a growing body of work specifically the students as partners uh, framework that aims to elevate students to collaborators and even co-creators in a course and into the more interactive participation realm. So if you think about where you are in your course, you know, where on the rung of this ladder would you fall in? What, what point do you, um, involve the student voice in your course. Just give a moment to look at this model a little and, and think about maybe your comfort level too. <laughs> I wanna move now to talk a little bit about um, student as partners and what that is. So moving up the ladder into students as partners, um, this is the realm of students partners. So SAP is a pedagogical framework that focuses on the relationship between students, instructors, and hopefully sometimes staff uh, to work in collaboration uh, to improve the teaching and learning experience. So this is defined by um, Bovel, Cook, Sather, and Belton as a reciprocal process, which all participants have the opportunity to contribute equally, although not necessarily in the same ways, to curricular and ped or pedagogical conceptualization, decision-making, 
implementation, investigation, or analysis. Um, and the goal of SAP work is to focus more on the process of partnership itself. Um, and this quote I really liked a lot, which kind of sums up the spirit of it, which is um, that it is open to and creating possibilities for discovering and learning something that cannot be known beforehand. So what are the benefits of doing student as partners work? Well, the students, there are many, but um, these are two key ones that, um, that I decided to put in here. So um, students discovering the depth of faculty commitment to learning is a key one. Um, and an enhanced knowledge about their discipline and the learning process with increased confidence to express their views in academic settings. And I know that um, a part of the Students as Partners initiative here um, at CTLT, Marissa um, Hall, who is a part of um, the team as researcher, is doing some research right now um, with um, some uh, data that is co collected from our um, projects that we have here at UBC. And I know that she mentioned finding some of the same themes emerge um, here as well. Um, others report enhancements to group cohesion, collective responsibility, student performance in assessments, as well as staff reports of transformed teaching practices. So let's hear from some of the instructors um, that were involved in some of these projects. Um, so we had a chance to do some interviews with some of the um, faculty member partners from some of the projects in the past. Um, and so we wanted to share them a little clips of them with you today. So um, in this clip, we're gonna be uh, hearing from Carolyn Lebrecht. Um, she, along with her student partners, um, Savinja, Shreya and Andy, worked on an SAP project together in 2022 to redesign some of French 101-102. Uh, in this clip, Carolyn talks about how her and her student partners came together for this partnership and a bit about what they worked on. And within that cohort, there were two students that came to me um, asking for more, meaning um, it was a French beginner course. So one of them wanted to do more reading, to have a, um, more input on the reading uh, comprehension and reading skills um, than what was provided with the course content. And the other one wanted to um, have more, um, I actually participate in um, shifting the course towards with more of a EDI uh, practice or EDI principles. Uh, someone that came to me very early with uh, what type of pronoun can I use in French for uh, if I identify as a non-binary student. And um, this is part of my research. So I was very happy to introduce all of that. And so those two students became kind of uh, uh, a poll of uh, what this course, this beginner course would need to add to the course content. Uh, the epitome of it, the, the peak of it was that the, those two students came up with uh, the, the idea, like a great contribution idea of um, creating their own resource for the uh for for creating more edi input into the course they created a comic book that would explain how to introduce the non-binary uh pronouns in french in a french beginner course so with very simple words because it's a french be beginner course and um and so they uh, distributed the work among themselves because one would uh, offer to write the scenario 
and uh, the other one offered to illustrate the scenario. We started to gather as a team and uh, explaining what the SAP is about. And it was clear from the beginning that there would be no hierarchy, but just what would, how would you like to contribute? And you, how would you like to contribute? How I would like to contribute? And it's been like that oh, during the entire project. Yeah. So as Carolyn mentioned, um, her team collaborated on incorporating some more EDI content into the course. Um, and actually in in collaboration with John, who was the, uh, their learning designer, they updated uh, a lot of course content and activities based on the this comic that they made. Um, so they also participated together as a team uh, for some conference panels, and they also wrote uh, an article together. And so there was some wonderful opportunities that came out of that experience for the students too, uh, as well as, you know, working on research and dissemination for the first time. Um, the students got to share their work and uh, with the, the local francophone community, um, who are going to be using it in some of the high schools in the area. And uh, they'll be hopefully using the comic uh, adaptation as well in, in other language learning departments, uh, as well as, um, you know, the students expanded their networks. Carolyn expanded her network. Uh, with you know some of this outreach and community building that they did around this this project, so lots of opportunities arose for uh, for everyone in this on this project. Uh, the next interview, oops, and within that cohort, the next interview uh, clip that I wanted to share with you was um, from Nahid Walji, who's a, a teacher for Mass 220, uh, his, his three students uh, who were his team members, uh, they were previous students of his and they worked together to develop some additional course materials to support the student learning in the class. In their project, Nahid had a goal in mind and he wanted to directly involve his students um, on implementing these ideas in a more systematic way. Here he talks about handing over some of his decision-making to the students and how that led to a very meaningful and authentic content being produced for the course. Thinking about just all my past teaching experiences and and I was thinking a lot about student engagement and the different ways we do to try and get students engaged in class. Um, and this particular class has, for example, a fair bit of like active learning, um, almost like a workshoppy kind of feel uh, to it. So that's that's something we're already doing quite a bit of. But um, I feel like a, a common thread in, in the vast majority of courses I've taught is that um, if if you, I mean. The student gives you permission and you put up work up there from the previous homework and say, this is how a perfect homework looks. The attention from the student goes way up, like in the audience immediately. Um, and I thought I want to uh, leverage that a bit more and make it a bit more systematic rather than hoping that in the given week, some student will produce the homework that I want and that they're happy and comfortable with it being put up in front of the class. Um, why don't we make this a bit more systematic? So then the idea was, well, why don't I just talk to students who were in the class and see if they can make these materials like really coming from their own voice? That's very important here. Um, so it's not written by me. It's not created by me. I'm sort of like more like a, an advising collaborative on the side kind of role. Um, but they are kind of like driving like what topics they want to talk about, what interested them most, and therefore what they want to like teach the other students, and just very much keeping their own voice in all of this. Um, and so that was sort of the the goal of what I wanted to paint, and that's why the student partners fund seemed like a great fit for us, basically. 
so part of the portion, as I mentioned, was like this written piece, and then the video piece. So in the written piece, they write up anything that they're interested in that they think will help the students. And letting the students be self-directed for this, um, like the, the collaborators, um, was worked out really, really well because there's a lot of topics in the course, they picked the topic that uh, was most interesting to them, so they're most keen to write about this. And I didn't ask them to say, you should write this about this topic, I just said, write something that you think would be helpful. And so what happened is that they they came up to all sorts of angles on it. They said, well, why don't we talk about common errors that we had or common errors that we saw our friends had when we were taking a course that are easy traps to fall into and we can like guide students to be careful of this. Um, or they picked examples that they really liked that really kind of like spoke to them well in the course and, and sort of put their own variation on it. I had one student who um, really liked the logic part of the course. And so what he did is he created a logic question, but it was something I would never write myself. Um, it involves some talking about Canadian celebrities and, um, you know, mentioning Ryan Reynolds and Toronto and Vancouver and it all felt very kind of like you know local and specific in some sense and um it was a, it was a great logic question like if this then Ryan Reynolds will do this and if that then Drake will do that and then you know, just piece it all together and I thought it was great and it's not something a I would naturally think of doing but b like coming from an instructor it doesn't work it doesn't have this hit in the same way right so that's not the kind of thing I would I would do, but you know, this is something from the student. It's a student perspective logic and they read it, they know who it's coming from. And I, I thought that was great. Um so that was one one example of where I saw like here's the student like ideas and influence coming in in a great way. So that was Nahid. Uh in the next example, um we'll hear from Sarah Ann Knutson, who um, was a part of a team that wanted to redesign History 353A, a course with a very diverse student body. The course uh, appeals to students from diverse backgrounds and positionalities and disciplinary backgrounds. So it was essential for Sarah Ann to consult with her direct, uh, her learners directly um, and incorporate as many diverse student voices as possible. Uh, here she talks about how she identified potential student partners to collaborate with and what that led to in their project. I knew based on my goals that I wanted to include more than one student partner. Um, that felt important to incorporate as many perspectives as, as possible. Um, I guess I'll say like, in, in thinking about recruiting students for this, I think one, one deciding factor for selecting students was to reflect on my own classroom experiences and determining which students seemed to really engage in the course. Um, it was really important for me to select students who were passionate about the course material. Um, to embrace students who had perspectives on how to improve the course. Um, and of course, I also intentionally selected students who are not history majors in order to seek feedback on that experience. Um, but I guess like the, the student partners that I ultimately invited had many of these qualities. Um, the three of us ended up bringing various different positionalities and experiences to the to the partnership, which led to really productive conversations. Um, I guess I'll also say that I selected students who demonstrated potential to build a really strong trust relationship. Um, so it was really important to me to have student partners who felt like they could speak up or even push back right, against some of my own ideas. So I wasn't necessarily looking for students who necessarily share the same views as me. And I think that ended up being a really good thing. Love it. And our last example, I knew, 
comes from Gail Hammond. Um, I spoke with Gail, um, who's a associate professor of teaching in uh, food and nutritional health, food, nutrition, and health. Uh, and her and her team worked on adding some enhancements to um, FNH 473, which John will give you a look a little bit later on in depth of um, their process a little bit. But um, yeah, here Gail talks about her approach on why she decided to reach out to a future student uh, in addition to a past student for her project. We thought uh, that it would be great to have this recent past student voice helping to strengthen the course basically it wasn't a complete redesign or anything and then um i also felt it would be really important to have a student who has not taken the course and what their aspirations are for the course what do they think they're going to learn in this course and what, what, what would be of value to them? So I reached out through my, uh, you know, networks, uh, just faculty colleagues and, and found a, 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 a fourth year student who was going to be taking the course in term two um, to get involved. So we had the sort of the incipient voice without any experience in the course. And then we had the, recent past voice and and my goal to make this a better course for all students. Yeah, so there's a couple, uh, I just wanted to share a couple of examples for you uh, there. And just to get into some of the specific examples and um, talk a little bit more about some of the work they produced, um, I'm gonna hand it over to John. Uh, thanks, Nicole. God. So in this next section, um, we'll just share some examples of student voices uh, as active designers in their own courses. And so in this example, from Caroline Lebrecht's partnership, uh, Caroline spoke earlier in one of the videos, um, they're exploring design in an introductory French course uh, or a couple of introductory French courses 101 and 102. And this partnership looked at innovative ways of how to incorporate, as Caroline said, uh, uh, equity, diversity, inclusion through their course content. And so the two students, Shreya and Savindia, in this partnership developed a comic um, that introduced students to the use of pronouns outside of the masculine and feminine forms in French. And so uh, in addition to this comic, the comic that you see on in this, in this photo, I know it's a little small, um, is just a sample of what the actual comic looks like. And it's very, very impressive. And it's, uh, I love it, it's super cool. Um, they made a, a, an interactive version of this comic by embedding questions uh, for an ungraded formative knowledge check. So um, they've used this comic uh, as part of some practice questions that are embedded through the online version of the course on Canvas. And uh, as Nicole said, this work has attracted a large amount of attention and mm -hmm. interest across UBC's language programs um, for adaptation and translation. And so, uh, um, yeah, this was uh, French 101 and 102. And the next slide we have, um, uh, an example from uh, a food nutrition health course, Gail Hammond's course at the Faculty of Land and Food Systems. Um, and the student instructor started looking at the design of this course, uh, FNH 473, Applied Public Health Nutrition, from a very macro level. So from a sort of like from an entire course perspective. And they began their work in the design by reviewing um, how their course learning outcome, how the current course learning outcomes and current learning materials and activities aligned with learning objectives and assessments. And through this course planning tool, they began all the, the entire team, the partnership of students and, and Gail began recommending pieces where current learning interactions needed to be either removed or updated or amended and they also brainstormed a number of, of new learning interactions and assessments. And so this is what 
on the right uh, with this photo, like really, really small, but uh, this is a, what, uh, um, it, current, what it used to look like um, and very text heavy, very link based uh, um, uh, modular weekly structure. Um, and then in the next slide, you, you can see some of the work that the students have done and out of the, the new ideas, uh, the partnership decided to redesign the Canvas course shell, um, introducing a new course structure, something that was, uh, uh, the students felt was a little bit more um, intuitive for uh, navigation, for setting the stage for their, their work um, in the course. They uh, added a course introductory and course closing videos from both an instructor and student perspective. And they also developed a number of online uh, interactive activities using uh, H5P like Caroline's team did as well. And then um, the next slide, please. So we got that macro level of course design from food nutrition, uh, from the food nutrition and health course. Um, to this micro level of course design for pharmacy two and two, and and here the student and, and instructor partnership focused their efforts on aspects of a particular module in the course. So not necessarily the entire course, but looking at it from a particular module, which is the nephrology module. And so if somebody can tell me what that means, I'd be happy to know. I have no idea. Um, so that included redeveloping a case study into an uh, innovative live in-person gamified escape room activity. Um, and, and this used H5P, it used Canvas, and it used in-person props like lockboxes and combined some in-person facilitation from the students, uh, the student and instructor partnership. It was really, really cool to see uh, it in action and then uh, piloted um, through the pharmacy program. Um, really cool use of course design, all developed by the student partnership. And then this uh, last example, um, a, a partnership from a second year dental hygiene course, uh, Jelena, Karen, and Swan Nguyen, uh, explored how to incorporate a mix of media and assessment to create uh, engaging content such as videos, according texts, alongside some quick formative knowledge checks such as drag and drop and multiple choice questions. So another micro level view of what you can do with having some student voices in your course. They're not necessarily an entire course, but pieces of a course or course content. Um, and so, Another great example of that here. Next slide, uh, you know, we want to emphasize the impact of student voices on, on course design. So I, I want to highlight students themselves and Rohil Sharma, one of our uh, students as uh, partner, the students as partners coordinator and formerly part of a partnership team is uh, joining us to, today to speak of his experience in course design. Um, and then I'll be sharing some quotes as well um, from the students as partners evaluation data. So Rohil, um, can you tell us a little bit about your experience in, in the students as partners program? Yes, and thank you, John and Nicole for putting this together and inviting me to speak a little bit. Um, so yes, I'm Rohil, I'm the students as partners coordinator and I've also had the pleasure of being a student partner engaged in course design work. So I get to be on both sides of the initiative. Uh, first working in partnership with Dr. Oral Robinson in the Department of Sociology, and now with Dr. Rosalind Verwood, who's here and is the strategist behind students as partners at UBC. And I can say that in my capacity as a student partner doing course design work, I was able to bring to my faculty partner a contemporary student perspective one that addressed the common concerns, opinions, and learning needs that I've witnessed anecdotally amongst the student body, particularly as it's been a while since my faculty partner was an undergraduate student. And so in my mind, my role was bridging that gap in understanding between students and educators. So 
given the nature of the course that we were redesigning, which was an introductory sociology course, Soci 200, which is Sociology of Families, um, our goals for a curriculum renewal were really to enhance the transformative pedagogy that we were bringing, and we really sought to engage students with their levels of agency. You know, the social sciences sometimes operate from what we would call a damage-centric framework where we focus on injustice and inequality without any, you know, necessarily positive call to action. And so this course redesign was concerned with getting students in touch with their personal capacities to mobilize their immediate networks in pursuit of actionable, doable, and tangible social change. And that was something that I, as a student, really propelled the work for in my faculty's mind because I brought forward a perspective that was concerned with the disconnect between what students were studying and how what they were studying could be operationalized. So kind of talking about sourcing student feedback, um, I was in a great position as a student partner who was co-designing the course to ask the right kinds of questions to the students enrolled in the course. So to frame myself as a peer seeking feedback and representing myself on their behalf to work with faculty to continually refine the course so it would meet the learning needs of the collective student body. And one way that we did this um, was through two minute memo forms. Um, and so they'd ask questions at the end of every other class, such as describe how sharing your personal connection to course content in small groups affected your feelings toward a tree achieving critical hope. Um, so really kind of getting at um, students sort of elicited responses to certain pedagogical activities that were a little bit more reflective. Um, and so really that reflective feedback and aspect of our course design, where the students were centering themselves and their own experiences and positionalities, um, that was a kind of praxis of the students as partners approach that I now think about all the time with Roslyn in my role as the student coordinator. Um, you know, where we're always emphasizing student experience and positionality and letting that assemble the landscape of uh, higher education. So that's just a little bit about uh, my work in course design as a student partner and how I've kind of let that guide the work that I do on the other side of the, of the initiative. Thank you, Rohil. Thank you for sharing your 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 experience and your voice um, and making an impact in in, in this in this course that you you helped uh, support and redesign, um, and I just wanted to share a couple more quotations from students themselves um, who have been part of the Students as Partners initiative and part of the course design process, um, and it really just emphasizes the emphasizes the importance of this work. Um, and so these quotes were pulled from our evaluation data from our fabulous consultant, uh, evaluation consultant, Marissa Hall. Um, so this SAP partnership was a great way to work towards dismantling the professor-student hierarchy and making learning much more collaborative. It is, is it a very interesting com concept that I really like the idea of designing an undergraduate course and having student input. So I don't know any other units, uh, universities that have come up with this idea, but this was definitely one concept that pulled me into the SAP project. And then the next slide, um, we have uh, a quote here that the experience was fantastic. I learned a lot of skills, especially in survey, survey design and analyzing results. Having the funding for this project was another significant benefit as it counted as formal work experience, which is great to have throughout the year. So. In addition to the design, uh, their course design experience, the, uh, their experience in building a partnership within a team, they've gained some professional skills such as survey design and and uh, actual work experience, working alongside uh, peers and and um, an instructor, uh, which is I think just an, uh, another added benefit to having. Uh, uh, student voices uh, with this kind of partnership work in in, in your course. Uh, and this last quote, I've gotten the opportunity to, to talk to many members like the tech team in pharmacy about managing 
uh, canvas for activities, engaging with John, myself, from the SAP side, which has been interesting because there's always unexpected ideas that work out perfectly, that work perfectly for us. These interactions have taught a lot, taught me a lot about working and communicating with different teams, which is crucial, which is a crucial skill for any job, workplace, or project. So highlighting also uh, the benefits of the professional skills that are gained and the competencies that are gained. Uh, also, in addition to the course redesign work uh, 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 that uh, is, is uh, the, the courses are benefiting from, you're also getting and turning out these, uh, you know, um, professional competencies and skills that the students are, 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 are gaining. Um, and so to wrap up, I know we're really, really early and we have a, such a really comfortable group here. And maybe if you're watching this video, um, you might want to reflect it on this uh, uh, in your own practice because we want you to think about your own teaching practices and the courses you design. Reflect on everything that you've heard Nicole discuss today and all the examples that you've seen from uh, the narratives from our instructors, the voices that our student voices, the examples from of course design. How do you think you could incorporate student voices in your own course design process? Um, and we have a Padlet here that you could participate in, but I'm, I'm not sure, Nicole, do you think it might just be easier just to type it in the chat or? Um, yeah, we're even, an intimate crowd. Know, <laughs> yeah, really intimate crowd. I think we can do this through the chat or you can turn on your microphones um, and to share your thoughts and ideas. Um, and we'll just maybe just give you a moment to sit with this question and reflect on everything that we've shared. Um, and hopefully you can share with us some of your ideas, your, your, your reflections on incorporating student voice in course of mind. Yeah. If you're, if you're, a uh, uh... A faculty member if you're teaching you know does it scare you does it <laughs> do you wonder what it could look like in practice i i think because i would teach in the summer it's really it's a very short term it's really hard for me to give any like to make change on the fly but i continue to let the student know that please or if there's anything that I change from last year, from previous year, I tell the student it's because the student told me last year. And I continue to ask them, like to let, ask them to give me input. I cannot change it now. I, like, I just cannot change it now. It's too fast. The course is going too fast. But I promise that I will take a look in and make a change for future students. Yes. And just being very transparent. I cannot make a change now, but... Please give me advice. Yeah. Of course. No one's making you do anything. So. I think Judy highlighted something really important, like that it's an ongoing process. Sometimes it's it's yeah. things you hear throughout your, your teaching um, and that it's not something that happens, happens at a point in time. Um, yeah. Like some of these students as partners initiatives are obviously point in time projects and they've had capacity to do some, some of this work, but um, the reality is like there, sometimes there isn't time and, and sometimes you're, you're listening. And I think that's also, uh, you're listening to your students and that's also a really good thing to, to do. And sometimes that gets, you know, translated to the learning designers and, and, and being agile and adapting course to certain changes that need to be made um and so it's really good to hear that uh um judy you're, you're taking those steps and and setting the tone and and um making yourself um uh or making your course available for those kind that kind of feedback i was just gonna say that um one thing that occurred to me as i was kind of sitting here and thinking about all these you know diverse ways that people are you know, bringing in student voices or might bring in student voices. There's also maybe an element too of, 
as an instructor, being able to say to future students who take the course, like, here's what I've been doing uh, with the help of students and student voices along the way to make this course better. Because I think, at least mm-hmm. myself, when I teach, I often forget about all the design work, all the prep work, all the feedback gathering, like what I've done, what I've thought about. I just then integrate it in and deliver the new course. But like maybe a moment to pause to say like, this course has been developed based on contributions in the following ways over the past X amount of time to be able to like convey that to students. So they know that it's not just something like hooked up in a, you know, <laughs> lab at some point, but like it's been thoughtful and there's been student contributions. Along. So like that moment to be transparent in how the course was developed and designed. So I was just thinking about that for a bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Having, uh, I think that knowing um, before you enter in a course and knowing that it has been made in consultation with or what aspects were were adapted or changed or modified whatever in response to student needs that signals to me as a learner okay they're open to hearing so yeah so i'm going to um put up some some names for you um (laughs) thanks russell so uh learning design and um, so as we mentioned, Nicole, that's me, and John, that's John. <laughs> um, we have been working with the students as partners um, projects for some time. And this term, Manuel Diaz, will be um, joining our little family of learning designers. <laughs> We're working with SAPs. And so we would love to talk to you about, um, thank you, John. <laughs> We would love to talk to you about students, pro- students, partners, work, or anything to do with um, improving your course. Quite, quite, quite honestly, anything to do with gathering feedback from your students, from maybe going into a more active role for your students to become um, have some autonomy in their courses or what's being taught. So, if you're interested in discussing any of that with us you can get a hold of us um here are our email addresses we would also like to acknowledge that um the sap team is mostly <laughs> rosalyn rohill and marissa um who really are the the core team of the sap and do a lot of this work and um, support us in this way. So big shout out to them and also to our um, SAP partners, um, SAP teams and contributors. We just wanna thank everyone for including us. And um, yeah, I think I think that's it for us. And we'll stick around for a little bit to see if anyone would like to stick around and chat a little bit. And if not, have a wonderful day. And thank you for coming to our uh, session.